Uh, Katie LaFalcia <laughs> caught me by surprise. Welcome to Irish Granny Tarot and welcome to our returning guest, Greg Oliar. And I have a surprise today. Rather than me synopsizing a book, we're going to talk with the author about Greg's newest book, Empress. And a little hint of why I'm not synopsizing it. <laughs> <laughs> 680 something pages, Greg, am I right? Yeah, it's like around 700 pages, something like that. It's long. It's long. I got to tell you, I read it in probably four days and I would have read it faster only I was doing other reading you know and taking notes on other stuff it reads really quickly and it's absolutely captivating but we're going to get into that first of all I wanted to tell you that in your honor I'm wearing my Byzantine earrings oh cool okay I got these at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in the dark ages when my husband and I were first dating we went to Boston from California and went to this museum. And these are a uh, reproduction of Byzantine earrings. And then I've got the, can you see the gold? Oh Maybe. yeah. It's like purple yeah. gold. Very cool. Yeah. 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 You know, got to, got to dress the part. Right. So I love this book. I absolutely love this book. Uh, it kind of reminded me a little of Colleen McCullough's books on Caesar. Okay. Are you familiar with those? I am not. Colleen McCullough, I believe, now I'm not, hope I'm not conflating different authors, is from, was, she died, was from Australia, maybe New Zealand, forgive me, mea culpa, but okay. you know, that, that part of the hemis that hemisphere. And she was something like a PhD in biochemistry or physics or something, but she was this genius about ancient history and she wrote a ton of books on um caesar the whole family lineage the events yeah, of yeah. his life i mean re you know really 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 first man in rome uh something crown i can't remember it's been so long but i if anyone is interested in that kind of history this book is a lot like that really really interesting and not necessarily um a time period I know a lot about. I went onto my myriad bookshelves hunting for my books on the Byzantine Empire. I was horrified. Very few. Mm -hmm. Before we go farther, Greg's other book, from which I quote liberally, <laughs> constantly. And you have other books. You have not uh, other fiction, right? Yeah, yeah. I have two novels that I wrote. Um you know, 10 years ago. Um, the first one is a thriller called Totally Killer, which is set in New York City in 1991. And then I have a book called Father Mucker, which is like the day in the life of a stay-at-home dad living in New Paltz, New York, which is where I oh, live. It's, it's a horror book, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really just an excuse for me to make jokes about having little kids. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's all that it's just... That's all that bottomless, it is. So. Bottomless well of humor there, I got to tell you. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> and then you have your sub stack. I do. Yeah, okay. which has what been three years called? now. I had. I can't believe it's been that long because I, I was like three years. It can't be three years. And I kept doing the math. But yeah, it's been three years now that I've been doing, you know, well, basically three flies. columns a week. I mean, it's, I don't know how I do it really. But, yeah, uh, I, I don't either. Don't you ever feel like your brain is sort of. Only the, constantly. Uh, constantly. Yeah. yeah. And then you do prevail. Mm -hmm. which is fabulous and then you do the five eight i do yeah and and i i watch that on fridays when i get home from work it's my um carrot that dangles in front of me <laughs> while i'm at work i listen to prevail and then i come home and watch the five eight. this this is my social life greg it's <laughs> well the you know the five eight for anybody that hasn't watched it i mean it's fun because it's a live broadcast and you know people go into the comment section which sort of takes on a life of its own. And I think a lot of people like watch it for the, you know, it's like a little party that we have to commiserate the events of the day. And we talk about horrible stuff, but we have a lot of fun when we're, when we're doing it. And, you know, we have I always good like guests. I like to see what you're stuff. drinking and, yeah. you know, and I'm, I really, uh, LB Lincoln's Bible. Is her name Stephanie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. And your wife's name is Stephanie. I know. That's why I, I mean, I call her LB all the time because okay. for a long time she was synonymous. But I also call her that because I, there's, you know, 
I yeah. Eight, there's six people that I talk to, and two of them named Stephanie, and it's confusing. It's not really confusing. I do. I can tell them apart. Right. Well, you know? I hope. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> hope <laughs> but yes, her name is also that. Yeah. That's why I was confused though. So okay. okay. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, anyway, she's my role model. Tell her I said hello. She has no idea who I, I am. Tell her I said hello. Okay. So. You've got all that stuff going on, and yet you have time to write over 680-something pages about the Byzantine Empire. Good God, that's just incredible. I love the deceit, and then later on, you use the word deceit in reference to it, and I thought, "Uh uh-oh, we're (laughs) reading Mm -hmm. each other's minds. But the deceit is that you are a coin dealer, ancient coin dealer, and uh, under the auspices of your job, in a complicated way, you encounter these ancient manuscripts, and this is the story that they read. And you actually do deal coins. Is that right? Yeah, I work for the, the, the stuff that's in the intro is true for the most part. Like, I do work for a company that deals in coins and banknotes, and uh, I've worked there for 10 years. You know, not just it's a writing job and an HR job, it's a little company here, you know, upstate, and it's been a lot of fun. And I've learned a lot of, you know, history, and I get to, um, read a lot about history and stuff as I, as I, uh, you know, research kind of the coins and tell the stories about them. But, um, the story that I tell about finding this manuscript is not true. So just for a little bit of, you know, background on the project in general, I wrote this book in 2015 into 2016. So pre-Trump before prevail, before dirty rubles, before anything, when I still was like, you know, writing novels. Innocent. Yeah. You know, before the fall kind of thing. And um, so and it was really great to write it. I I felt like um, very inspired. I, you know, during the evening, I would read about whatever historical thing was coming up in the book. And then I would get up early in the morning and write write about it. And um, the book, as you mentioned, it's it's presented as kind of a found artifact, this thing written by Anna Komnini, who in real life was the eldest child and daughter of the emperor Alexios Komnenos, who was emperor from 1081 to 11 something. Uh, I can't remember. And um, 30 something years. Thank you. And uh, yeah, no, now the other thing, it's been so long since I wrote it that now I can't remember certain details, which is also sort of fun. And in real life, she wrote a book called the Alexiad, um, which is a real uh, history of her father's reign. So that's and, uh, real. I had a lot of mm-hmm. trouble. I spent a lot of time at the beginning of the book Googling things and thinking, surely he didn't read this and surely he didn't read that. And I finally just gave up and enjoyed the story. That's what you ha- that's what you have to do, because most of the stuff is true. I'm, I, I I was very meticulous in my research. I yes, yeah. read a lot of I don't know if you could see the, the Byzantine books behind me. They're, they're up there. There's quite a few of them. Oh, um, wow. Are they on the other side now? I don't know. There, there, there's quite a few that I read and um, because again, people don't know anything about the Byzantine Empire, which is both good and bad. It's like, hey, it's a 700 page book about the Byzantine Empire. Woohoo! And uh, most people just know the word Byzantine as confusing, meaning confusing and complicated, and icon. <laughs> you know, that's the one word that's really survived. <laughs> but even that was, you know, 500 years before the events of, of my book. Yes. Not 500. Years which before. I discovered. We'll talk mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. Centuries before. Um, so, the, the the story it's called empress and the hardest part was figuring out what the title was going to be um it's mostly the story of maria of alanya who is a a real historical figure she was the a, a princess of a, a king called bagrat from georgia and the caucasus and they brought her to constantinople to marry um who became michael uh duke michael the seventh dukas um and she was i think 15 when she came over and spoke oh, no practically Greek. practically ancient, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoke no Greek, you know, didn't speak the language, has never really been at places before. Um, actually, she'd been there before when she was a little girl, but uh, was sent back and it was, you know, imagine that, like you're this, you know, your father's the king and you'd be like, okay, you're going to go a thousand miles away and marry this weird guy you've never met. Bye. And it's not like they had FaceTime and, you know, that, that's it. You n- almost never saw any of these people again so um and she went there and in real life was sort of remarkably married the emperor um and then wound up (laughs) she married another emperor 
who was the emperor after Michael, who was 50 years older than her and was Alexios's lover. So she was involved with three different emperors and did all this like machinations and crazy stuff and intrigue of the, you know, this almost Shakespearean kind of uh, palace intrigue. And most of the stuff in the book is real. It's stuff that happened. And, and um, you know, I, I took liberties in certain ways because they didn't really write about their sex lives that much. So I filled that part in. Um, I figure if I'm going to write about something as sort of um, quote unquote boring as uh, the Byzantine Empire, I had to put in lots of sex and violence. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, but oh, some that of was the one of my questions, how yeah. much of this stuff did you find primary source materials and how much of it is from your Well, one of the like nature? Maria of Alanya was beautiful. Like that's been numerous sources attest that. So again, the book is about the most beautiful princess in all of Christendom who comes from this one place to Constantinople. I mean, that's, that part is real. And, uh, the way that the women, um, had to, uh, I, wait, let me back up. This book is presented as Anna Komnini, the real life author of the Alexiad, mm -hmm. writing the secret history. So right. saying, okay, right. this is the thing I wrote to make everybody happy. This is what really happened. And now she and, was, if I got this right, and I could be a generation off, but she was the granddaughter of Alexios and she's Anna Delacine or... That's Anna Delacine is Alexios's um, mom. Mom. Oh, yeah. King, it's a little blurred, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to explain? To everybody? Well, they're all they all have the same names. You know, this is a Roman convention. Like Constant Constantine the Great in real life had like three sons, and they were named Constantine, Constantius, and Constans, and he had a daughter named Constantia. Like they well, did this. That's how Romans did it. That's just how they did it. So that's how you know, they did it. every third Maybe. person is named Anna. There's a lot of people named Nik Nikifaros in the book. Yeah. You know, and I yeah. try to give them nicknames, sort of to yeah. almost be able to tell them apart a little bit. Um, but well, in the Roman Empire, if your father's name was Julius, mm -hmm. which is actually a last name, but we'll go with it, then you would, if you were the first daughter, you'd be Julia Prima. And the next daughter would be Julia Secunda. And then the next daughter would be Julia Tertia, et cetera. And you'd have to have a nickname because otherwise nobody knew who you were. Yeah, it was just a, it's a strange naming convention. So yeah, but the important thing is that Anna is Alexios's firstborn. She's really smart. She's really savvy, but it she should have taken over. But she's him. a girl. But she's yeah. a girl. And uh, and therefore, and so the voice I had, I had a lot of fun writing in her voice because she's at the time that she's writing this history. She's like seven, almost 70 years old, holed up in this monastery. And she's very smart. She's very educated. She has a huge vocabulary. She's very proud and bitter. And she claims not to like sex or gossip or impropriety. And yet all she can do is talk about sex and gossip and impropriety. Yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, there's the, all of this weird stuff going on and uh, you know, that was a lot of fun. So um, the way that I kind of had it structured is it's a sweet, it's an epic. It goes through, you know, several decades, you know, 50, 60 years of, of history of what's going on around the time of the first crusade, um, which happened when Alexios was, was emperor. And in the book I had, um, you know, the first crusade really was a, it was an op. It was a, it was a, it was basically QAnon. It was the, the, the people in Rome making up bullshit stories about, oh excuse. my God. Yeah. yeah. And this is, again, I wrote this in 2015 before any of this stuff had taken off. It's, it's them saying, oh my God, there's pedophiles in the basement of the pizza house. We need to go kill. We need to go, you know, right. do this and this. And where the pedophiles are, you know, the, the Seljuk Turks who'd taken over Jerusalem and they just spread all these crazy stories that weren't true. Um, Which, to, be clear, mm -hmm. to be clear, because I'm on probation, this is not what you believe and it's not what I believe. This is just repeating nonsense that we've heard and putting it in the context of the Byzantine Empire. There, did I cover everything? I think you, I think you covered everything. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, so I made it seem like Anna and, and her uh, mother um, or her grandmother read her just invented that idea 
and they got the first crusade rolling. Yeah, you gave her the credit for coming mm -hmm. up with it, and, and a really young too. What was she? Nine years old or something? Yeah, well, I was a little older than that, but it, she, she's yeah, she's extremely precocious, and because Maria um, was involved with Alexios and and she was betrothed to Maria's son, she spent a lot of time when she was a little girl in real life with Maria of Alanya and loved her, and they had a really great relationship and and. Um, you know, and learned all the inner workings of the, the how the palace intrigue works and all this kind of stuff from her. Um, so there, there's a lot of that dynamic. And she often explains throughout the book how she knows what she knows. Um, I heard this from my father. I heard this from Maria. I heard this from my mother and on and on. So uh, did you, you must have looked at old uh mosaics and paintings and manuscripts that depict these people since they were real people how how desperate do you wish that you had desperately do you wish that you had photographs that you could see what they really look like i mean it would be great to have photographs i, I have a good sense and sometimes maybe you don't want too much of a of a sense of it you know you want to use your imagination a little bit um I've seen a picture, like it's almost like a drawing of Maria where she looks, you know, she's pretty, you know, but I don't know on the coins, they don't look, you know, coins are not a great way to, especially, I, I think that kind of beauty doesn't really translate to to coinage. Like Charles III of England looks good on a coin because he's kind of an old man now, you know? Yeah. But when Cleopatra, you're, they didn't do her any favors. No, she, yeah, <laughs> it's, not, it's not so great. So um, it would be great to have photographs of all these people, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. standards, standards changed so much that that true, yeah, yeah. Who knows in cultural context what will we think? I I don't know. I think that I I don't know that it changes that much. I think it. I think you know, pretty is pretty. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> so what uh, has all got to do about uh, the the equilibrium of your features? Yeah. So yeah. you know, yeah. So I, yeah, I, re I really wanted to ask you uh, a few questions, but the first question that I wanted to ask was, if I may borrow from the vernacular, WTF, I'm going to read you a quote from your book. Okay. Uh -oh. quote, Ancient as I am at 69. Mm -hmm. Hello. I, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I looked it up. I thought, okay, I'm going to give you credit that you know what you're talking about. Sure enough, the average lifespan in the year 1100 was 55 years old. If you survived childhood, you had a 50-50 chance of yeah. reaching 55. So I guess 69 is venerable. There's a lot of there's a lot of lines like that, which I had a lot of fun writing. Yeah, I think I yeah. at one point I say Maria is ruined by all by any metric. And she's like 30. Yeah. You know, and she's clearly not. You know, everybody's well, like gaga. Over it. Yeah. Cold breath on the back of my neck there. Great. That's <laughs> making me nervous. <laughs> yep. And the other question that I had was about all the research that you did. But you sort of um, answered that the Alexia is a real thing. Was the uh, chronographia real? The chronographia is the um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that's the Celos book. Yes, they are. that's real. And then it's the Tetro Biblos. Tetra Biblos is real. You do you not have you don't have Tetra Biblos? No, that's that's astrology. That's not tarot. So uh, uh yeah, I don't do astrology. Yeah. The Tetra Biblos is the only astrology book I've ever had was Linda Goodman's Love Signs. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I can tell you all about what sign is not compatible with my sun sign, which is awfully close to my husband's. It's interesting. <laughs> We're practically diametric opposites, so I don't know how much weight to give any of it. You know, I, it's I, all it's all a crapshoot. But yeah, no, that's that's a real that's a real thing for sure. Yeah, um, okay. one of the oldest texts that there that there is about astrology. So you went. Uh, I, tell me if I'm intruding and you don't want to talk about this, but I'm just really nosy. You were in Berlin recently. Yep. Was that for coins? Was yeah, yeah, it was a coin show. It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I put two and two together. Pretty good, okay. huh? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I it's good. It out. Um, let's see. What else did I want to ask you? Oh, have you ever been to Istanbul? No, and I, I, I tried to go again around 2015, and I, I wrote somebody through the university here, and I got 
I, I, I forget what it was or who offered to do it. All I would have had to do is pay to get there and they would have covered my cost for like a week to stay oh, and to drive God. around. But I couldn't go because I had to go to a, I had to work. So, and I, I don't know now after writing about Erdogan all this time, I don't think I, I'm safe going there. So, I, I, you know, once that, once he leaves maybe, but um, right. I, I, I looked at pictures and I looked at maps and I really tried to immerse myself in, in what it's like. And um yeah, it was a th one of the largest cities in the world at the time. And it's right on the, um, it's surrounded by water on three sides. The There's lots of weird like yeah. eddies and it's very hard to land boats on it. And yeah. the side that's on the land has a series of walls. It's it's yeah. impregnable and it never had gotten taken over. And, 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 and the, the fact that they, they string a chain across mm -hmm. the only entrance to that, I never heard that before. They also had this thing called... Um, what is it greek fire like byzantine fire where and to this day no one knows what it is but it's, yeah. it's essentially a flamethrower that yeah. people would come over and they'd be like bye zoom and kind of like napalm for the ancient yeah. people yeah yeah so they were they were really good about defending themselves and they you know they knew how to play the game in a lot of ways with with you know um even like Attila the Hun went there and they were like, oh, you don't want to go here keep going into europe it's better over yeah. there you know like they, they were, were good at by the uh the you know barbarians uh, people's yeah. understanding of of the fall of the Roman Empire has a few misconceptions. There wasn't a day when suddenly they were attacked by barbarians. That's not what happened. But when a surge of uh, I believe Visigoths went through Alaric, I think they just yeah. told them you know keep moving, just keep going. You know we don't want you to truck with us. And, but uh, just for the benefit of people listening, um, yeah, because not everybody's a big old gigantic egghead uh history but <laughs> i was gonna say we should cover what the byzantine empire even is for people right, who don't know. is that right. where you were gonna and go okay that constantinople and istanbul are the same place right so what happened is as you said rome as a city and as the center of the empire gradually was displaced as the capital so constantine the great in i think 330 a.d somewhere somewhere around there built a city which he called new rome um, in a uh, on the ruins of a of an old old place that was known as Byzantium, uh, hence Byzantine, and it became known as Constantinople. And after he left, or he died, and his his kids took over, and the the there were two different emperors. One was in Rome, one was in uh, Constantinople, and it went on like that for a while. And eventually, Rome fell. Yeah, well, um, Rome got too big for its britches and couldn't administer the whole empire from but one the place. city, the city itself collapsed. Yeah. But in the east, it was still okay. So yeah. the Byzantines didn't think of themselves as Byzantine. They thought of themselves as Romans. Romans, right. And yet after a certain point, they spoke Greek. So it was very confusing. Yeah. Um, Justinian the Great, who this is around, I think, eight like the ninth century, something like that. Maybe it was, no, it was earlier than that. It was, it was in the 400s. Yeah. 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 The five, four that. to 500. So he, yeah, he was in, I think he was the last Byzantine emperor that still spoke. He was either the last one that spoke Latin or the first one that spoke Greek. I can't remember. And he rounded up. He, he did a lot of stuff with the law, like the, 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 um, the laws of Justinian are responsible and, and sort of the basis for even now, some of, some of the laws he was, codified stuff and he was one of these guys that just came in and was really good at administrating and he married um theodora who theodora. was a um you know some people say an actress some people say a prostitute what's the difference and she was awesome also and they sort of ran the whole place and it was like amazing. fabulous stories the and stories. they um oh my god he had enough um soldiers and forces and all this stuff that he was going to retake rome and reunite the empire but um, the plague of Justinian happened and a lot of the soldiers got sick and died. So we couldn't do it. That's a huge what if in the history of Europe. If that hadn't happened, Justinian totally would have conquered that. And a lot of things would have been different. Now, this happened. This is, you know, years before the events I, I talk about in my book, um, which is a, uh, even Byzantium is starting to be in a little bit in decline by the time of, of, of Alexios and, and the Crusade. Um, and he needed to use the crusaders to kind of fend off, you know, the idea was we have all of these hot-blooded soldiers coming from Western Europe. 
we need to have them fight the uh, the Turks on the other side of us and kind of take care of business for Distraction, us. Distraction, right? Yeah, the and, and they did strategy. all this stuff, yeah. I mean, to make them, you know, pledge fealty to the Byzantine Empire so or the emperor so that if they conquered Jerusalem, it would actually be returned to Byzantium. You know, it, it was masterfully done in that in that sense. They, they staged it, so they had the, the – they, they – created a throne room or reinstituted this throne room yeah. and they had the throne like fly up in the air and there were like fire that came out of it and they brought in these lions they wanted to dazzle these rubes from france who because were that's what and, they yeah. were they were just peasants they collected along the way right yeah it, it yeah. was a well they a lot of them were um were nobles who were like the second and third sons and that kind of thing so they had money and some influence but they didn't have land and they were constantly fighting with each other. So it was a good move for even the Franks to be like, why don't you guys go fight over there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a that. sort of a crazy a thing. For you. Okay. I found a picture of Manuel Comnenus. The, yeah. That, yeah. The, the first crusade. Let's see. Can you see that? Yep. That's the, the only thing I had about the first crusade in all the chronicles of the crusades. It's a very Catholic book to have, isn't it, Greg? Yeah. 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 I mean, the crusade stuff is interesting, but I sort of looked at it as a, it's an excuse for them to like do stuff, to gain territory and, you know, get rid of the enemies that were, in, had encroached on the side. I talk about, there's a famous battle of Manzikert, which is yeah. I think 1071 before Alexios. And it was under the auspices of this emperor named um, Ramanos Diogenes, who was like kind of one of these swaggering. Yeah. He's almost like a like an Elon Musk type, like that personality <laughs> type, you know, thinks he's great, thinks he can do everything. And then he cannot. And, you know, made the cardinal error of, uh, you know, that they that they talk about in um, Princess Bride. Don't get into a land war in Asia. Well, he got into a land war in Asia and it didn't end well because he wanted to go fight the Turks and the Turks kept like retreating and retreating and retreating. Glory. And finally, he yeah. came so close and you know, he couldn't retreat more. And then they came out of the, some of his people left because they didn't like him. And then, um, <laughs> you know, he got attacked and, you know, it was, it was a decimation. And the only, the only reason that it wasn't a complete catastrophe is that so many people like bailed on him um, and it was over quickly, but he wound up getting captured, but they weren't sure if he was alive or dead for a while. And uh, this is all true, by the way, this is a great yeah. story, a, yeah. a real story that the, the head of the, the Turks was this guy named Alp Arslan, which means that, you know, brave lion or something like that. And um, so he captures, this is the Byzantine Empire emperor and he's captured him on the field of battle and he brings it back to the capital and he's like, okay, what would you do if you were me? What would you do with you? And Romano says, well, I would I would parade you in chains in, in down the streets of Constantinople and then I would probably execute you, you know, yeah. whatever. And he says, uh, our boss one says, I will do something even worse. I am going to set you free. And it's like, ooh, because he knew ooh. this guy's going to go home and he's Burn. so humiliated. It's just going to yeah. it's going to yeah. fuck things up even more. Um, so that's the thing. Also, there's a lot of Anna in the book doesn't understand, you know, Islamic culture at all. And she's, yeah. you know, really Christian and all this stuff. And all the all the Muslims in the book are very cool. I think I have tried to write. Them. Oh, yeah. Well, they they're have... all like way cooler than you know, yeah. the guy going on. Yeah. And uh, so that that that's a real story that happened. And so you read this, you're like, that's awesome. That belongs in the movie. Like that's just you know kind of a perfect thing. So, well, uh, I, actually, that was a question I was saving for later. But since you brought it up, I'm going to go okay. ahead and ask you right now. I know now. we're bouncing around all over. I'm ruining your plan. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's not a plan. It was just I took notes <laughs> while I was reading. Every time something occurred to me, you know, I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. So here's a question for you: If you could cast the movie of your book who would you put in it oh god i don't know you know it's hard to, it's hard to say like because also they it goes through the the time yeah. you know yeah um so the beginning of the book the first it's basically the book is divided into two books and the first one is mostly maria of alanya kind of at coming there at 15 and how she grows into the become an emperor right. empress and all that. But the empress that's there is named Eudokia. Yeah. And she's the the wife of um uh Constantine the 10th who's this kind of really effete bookish not very good em nice guy terrible emperor, you know like that kind of thing. Um maybe like a Merrick Garland type, 
you know, oh, like, way, way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something <laughs> like that. Like so into his faith and this stuff, but yeah. she's running everything there. And um, so, you know, the, the whole book kind of ties into, you know, how does she do it? How can she, you know, take all these forces and make them work for her and get what she wants. And it's hard because she's a woman and she doesn't have the physical strength and the, the army behind her. And she's, there's forces that don't like her and there's all this politics. And when she falls, she falls very, very quickly. And Maria is suddenly like, Oh, okay, here I am. And she's like 18, you know, or 19 yeah. or whatever. Now she's I very... got her wardrobe and her gold and her rooms mm -hmm. and her authority and yeah. not her experience. And... Right. And, yeah. and she loves and her. Yeah. Yeah. Very sad. And, and not entirely as Machiavellian, but she grows into it. Yeah. 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 So, so oh, your question was about the casting. So you want somebody yeah. older, like a real, like an older, but kind of, you know, very, with tremendous gravitas to have to play, yeah. you know, yeah. a part like that. So, well, um, I was thinking you might want to do a movie and a sequel, and one could be more gladiatorial, you know, like the gladiator, mm -hmm. and then the other could be more like Merchant and Ivory, and it could show you the in, interpersonal relationships and the lives of the women, and and you could do a, a real justice to the to the art and the culture and the, you know, the that art. That works for me. Yeah. yeah, I but think it'd be a better different. show than a movie. I think it would be like a, you know, a bunch of seasons on HBO or Showtime. Or oh, something. right. I was thinking Netflix. but <laughs> Yeah, either way, whoever, yeah. whoever wants the project, just, you know, call my agent. Um, <laughs> the thing yeah. that holds me back from casting it is I don't know who anybody is. I don't know who any of the actors are anymore. <laughs> I mean, I there's so many, there's so many good ways to go. Yeah, there's a lot of good ways to go. I mean, Maria is hard, you know, because you're, are you really going to put like, you know, somebody, a teenager. No, it has to be somebody who's probably 25 that looks young or something like that. So, um, well, that's the problem with a lot of historical movies. They don't do justice to the story. The best example is, is, uh, Roman biblical type stories made in the 50s, those sorts of movies with Ava Gardner, you know, and they've got the 1950 hairdo and the 1950 <laughs> yeah. music in a toga. You know, it's nuts. Uh, they don't, they're not true to the, to the cultural and chronological context of the story and it detracts immediately. So that's why I thought you might want to do a big splash with all the fighting and the crusade, you know, and the torture chamber and all that stuff, but yeah. then something more refined historically that really gives you a feel for what it must have been like, because to me, you can get lost in this story. Uh, it's fascinating the way that they live. Here's here's a question for you. You have a quote. Uh, the real tragedy is the confinement to a convent of women. Mm -hmm. and, and men can't know the anguish. It's a quote from the book. And I guess I kept wondering, how are you so good at getting into a woman's head? No understanding. And I know that women and men are not so terribly different, but their life experience, and especially men, is dramatically different. Women uh, were pawns. Uh, if they were nobility, they were pawns from the day they were born. They were engaging newborn babies, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is a mind blower. I know. I know. But we can't even agree on a middle name, you know. And then they're... <laughs> just unbelievable so how do you how did you do that it was a little bit like you were uh channeling somebody um thank you for saying that because i don't know that i that it was successful so i'm glad to hear that, that it was um, i fell for it yeah i i thought so i mean i felt i felt good doing it at the time i felt like i and i don't think that anna speaks for all women i think anna is a very specific person and i got I understood her like her. She's everything that she is, 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 um, is in the ambition to take the throne and her whole life is wrapped up in that. And now she's looking back on it and the, the disappointment and the, you know, the, the kind of like, this is, you know, ca karmically wrong that she didn't get this gig, you know, oh, yeah. and, and yeah. how that feels like I, I am not a woman, but I am a, I am a novelist and I, I know what rejection and, and what yeah. it feels like, certainly. Yeah. Well, so, I often say there's been some hideous mistake made because I was meant to be in a wealthy family. <laughs> and I don't understand what went wrong, so I completely relate. Uh, I don't relate to 
that kind of ambition and that kind of drive and that willingness to lay it all on the line and, and thinking of their children, you know, thinking of their sons and making the right marriages for their daughter. Yeah. I, I just don't relate to that at all. I just am, am a much lazier, uh, non-competitive person. You, you mentioned the casting. Um, a friend of mine from high school, um, she was a senior when I was a freshman and was in all the plays um, named Allison Weller, who is an actress, you know, and, and she was great in high school and she remains really great. Um, I got her to do the, I don't know if you heard, I did the first, the intro and the first oh, chapter. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, as, a, as an audio, but it's it's yes. prohibitively expensive to produce my own audio book, which I would love to do it. But uh, I was really So she read for that and, uh, and she would actually be awesome to Biana, like, like she's perfect actually. So there, there's your question. <laughs> she, oh no, that, that you tell her that that's what drew me to the book was hearing her. She's great. Isn't, isn't yeah. she great? Yeah. I, thought yeah. She, I was like, yeah, oh, really, good. really, really stuff. good. Yeah. So let's see here. Oh, well, the other thing that you talk about quite a bit in the book and, and, you know, it surprises me whenever uh, a guy shows any, interest or understanding you talk about women going through their pregnancies and going through the experience of birth and dealing with uh nursing and bonding to the child that they have and those are often uniquely uh maternal sorts of situations and i would think that that would be a challenge for a, a man to write about as well as you do well thank you for saying that um yeah, you know, I think one of the things that I was going for writing the book is I have a theory just in general about people, which is that people have always been the same. Like we're all funny and this and that. And and if you plopped us down in, in Constantinople, if we could speak the language, everything would be the same. The, the sensibilities, the all of it, you know, it wouldn't be like weirdly foreign. It would just be the same. So I wanted to take this historical thing and put modern stuff in there in some ways. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of the, you know, um, women at that time, people that they lived with were these, you know, nursemaids and people that, you know, hung out with them and all the time, like somebody like Anna would, would have a nurse in just like in Romeo and Juliet, you know, like that kind of thing mm -hmm. that that would be somebody that came to Constantinople with her when she was little when yeah. she was 15 and stayed with her well, ever since. Probably had her own infant at the time that she was born yeah. mm -hmm. and was therefore lactating and was assigned nursing right. baby because royal women didn't do that. Right. Yeah. So her trying to be like, no, I'm going to do that. You know, um, I mean, I did write a book about being a stay-at-home dad. So I do know some of the, um, <laughs> I wasn't, I, my wife was here too, but, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I was observing some of the stuff that happened and, uh, you know, I thought, no, I want her to be kind of modern in that sense. Like everybody else would be like, what are you doing? No, I'm doing this. It's better this way. And it is, you know, as studies have shown. And, uh, one of my, one of my best friends here is a midwife. So, you know, in real life, so oh, I could really? get, I got some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the scoop on her. Like, I'm like, what would you give, you know, to, to, you know, if you want to, having a if you have an ectopic pregnancy right, right. and you what need to abort do? what would you do yeah. if you couldn't use modern medicine and boy that I kind was of so timely that yeah sub right that was so timely the whole time i was reading it i was thinking oh my god yeah because she hasn't i mean i don't know if it comes out but she has an ectopic that's yeah. how i envisioned it anyway yeah. and uh or, or wrote around it and the um similarly um andronicus when he dies in this kind of weird way i kind of make it I want him to have um, the sarcoma, like the AIDS sarcoma that you get. Like I That's, tried to. I wonder yeah. about that. Yeah. Like I tried to just. All right. What are the What are the symptoms of this? How does this yeah. manifest? Yeah. Kapo That's what this Kapo guy's going to have. Kapo Kapo yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I knew that's what it was, and I thought, well, yeah. isn't that interesting? And and you know, that's something um, to entertain the thought that was it around then, and then kind of went underground you know i think there was a lot of things that were and you know and who the hell knows you know people like you read in the bible oh, herod died of herod's evil and nobody really knows what that is other than it was awful and painful There's well they theories, think he, but... he died of kidney disease that he went into uremic poisoning and it can be a really horrible death 
Yeah. Uh, because you're building up toxins, you're not eliminating them, you're getting edematous, so you're swelling up like a balloon. I mean, it's just, it's awful. Yeah. So uh, before they invented dialysis, you know, people died of that. Yeah, it's horrible. And yeah. that's, you know, I wanted to I wanted to get that in there too, like the medical shit that they had to deal with, not yeah. having modern medicine and yeah. sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't and it oh, really I just love that stuff. I love, you know, depends yeah. on so I did try to, you know, get it as accurately as I could, but you know, sometimes Well, it's it a is. singularly Irish Catholic thing to fantasize as a child like, "Oh, I could cut my finger and die of blood poisoning." You know that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, but there's, and I'm surprised that we're we're now 40 minutes into this, and you haven't mentioned all the eye gouging that goes on. In my well, mind. that was my next question, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was trying to think of a, of a uh, uh, diplomatic way of bringing this out. Did you get it from primary sources, or is this the result of your twisted brain? <laughs> um, no, this is a real thing. So the oh, the, the thinking is, Byzantines didn't like to execute people. They found that capital punishment was um, bad. They thought it was a sin to murder, right? So um, they didn't want to do that. And they also had a, um, so, but cut, so instead they would like cut somebody's nose off, you know, or whatever. So you had all these like people with noseless people wandering around because, you know, they didn't want to execute somebody. They felt like that was more humane. So, uh, which, I was going to say we thumb our noses at that. Ha ha. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's yeah. it's it it, it 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 it's certainly a position that you could argue. Yeah, we didn't kill them. We just but we needed to punish them, you know, whatever. So there was also a tradition that if you were blind, you could not be emperor. Right. So if you had some kid that was maybe going to inherit the throne, the best thing, to, best way to get him out of the way was to, blind. you know, take his eyes blind. out. Right. Yeah. And uh so this happened all the time in Byzantine history. Which, which is... kind of shows you that they were uh, perceptive enough to know how much you you learn about people from body language and mm -hmm. just observing interactions at a distance. And when you can't do yeah. that, you're not getting the full story about yeah. the situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... it's uh, but I, So <laughs> what I discovered in my researches is that there are two ways of putting someone's eyes out. Oh, you good. Can, let's go into it. <laughs> the 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 nice way is you take like a hot iron, oh, right, right, and you hold it very, very close to the eyeball, but not in it, and eventually it burns out, and then you repeat process on the other eye. The bad way is you just gouge that damn thing out, and if you gouge it out, then it's gonna get infected, and the person's probably gonna die. Gonna but die. that's not your fault. All you did was gouge that. So in the book you see different ways of doing it. Like yeah. at, at one point there's a scene where a guy who thinks he's going to get executed asks Alexios, he's like, you need to put my eyes out and he doesn't want to do it. He's like, I, I'm not going to do that to you. He's like, you have to, you have to do it. And uh, you know, it's one of these horrible things. Cause I mean, imagine doing that to somebody would be like, Ooh, you know? Um, so, but it was part of the, the culture and part of that thing. The other thing that was part of the culture is that eunuchs ran the entire empire. Yeah, so, that's what and, I wanted to ask you about the eunuchs. That's true also. And yeah. not only that, but it was illegal within the empire itself to create eunuchs. So you couldn't do it if you were Byzantine, but if you were outside the empire, plenty of people, you know, especially their second and third sons, they're just like, all right, we're just going to do this thing and you're going to go get a job at the palace. And uh, that's how we'll survive. So you had, yeah. you know, uh, basically immigrants coming in running the whole damn show, right? Immigrants, they get the job done in Byzantium. Byzantium was a wonderfully diverse culture in a lot of ways. Um, so, it was a crossroads, right? Yeah, crossroads, so. it was a crossroads. It was the bulwark against various things, but it, it just, it, it, it was cool in that, in that you know, diverse way of having lots of people running the palace and the palaces and the systems that they used were so good. The tax, the system of collecting taxes was so good that the empire probably survived 200 years longer than it otherwise would have just because the money was kept coming coming in yeah, yeah. and yeah. and and you had to be a really really crappy emperor to screw that up um, so have you ever heard a recording of a castrato 
singing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's creepy, kind of. Isn't it eerie? Yeah. It's just eerie. Nowadays, they don't, uh, well, I was going to say, they don't use castrati anymore, but they, they uh, came up with a way to get close to that timber voice but there are some really old recordings of, of the you know the very first time they were able to get it down for posterity and they eerie is exactly the right yeah. otherworldly sound really interesting let's see here what else can i ask you about well I, you know i wanted to talk about the sexual politics in general you know anna and her son alexios they were close yep and that was just unbelievable. And then uh, the narrator, her father, right, mm -hmm. was pre predatory upon her. And the whole notion of manipulating your children, not so much caring about them as individual people, but with the thought in mind, how are they going to fit into this monarchical empirical system and all i could think of was uh princess diana you know she's related to prince charles they're like distant cousins okay. not closely related but re well they're all very incestuous the royal oh yes monarchies have to be you know it's, yes you know. yes and well you know I was going to say something as a snarky remark, but I'm afraid I'll get in trouble. So I won't say Yeah, we don't it. want that. Um, no, but uh had to do with uh, organisms that are cold-blooded. and. <laughs> okay. I'll leave it at that. But, you know, that the notion that they would have two children and they're both boys so that they ful she's fulfilled her broodmare mm -hmm. uh, requirements. That's old. That's, that's nothing new and, and uh, remarkable. That is the way their entire families have run from time immemorial. I, I did, think you did a good job of showing the machinations of all these people deciding uh, you're having, you just had a, a girl. Now who can we pair that up with to yeah. our best advantage for land and power and control? Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, and the way that like how young the girls are when they're, it's really vile. And that's all, I didn't make that up, you know, no, uh, I know. you know, I know, Alexios married a 10 year old, which is yeah. horrifying. Yeah. Um, and, and on the flip side, Maria then married somebody who was 50 years older than her the second yes. time around and, uh, and then was, was stooping, uh, Alexios, but wasn't allowed to see him, uh, because of impropriety and contrived to adopt him under the, under the, the auspices of the, the patriarch of the church in her position as, uh, as ex empress or whatever. So, uh, therefore, since it was her son. They she could, could be alone. Him. They could yeah. be alone. Yeah. And uh, that's true. She really yeah. did that. She really no, did make it. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was her idea. Genius. You know what it reminded me of? I, I know it's not in a uh, really uh, connected story, but it kind of reminded me of that weird couple in San Francisco who were raising the Cane Corso dogs in their little apartment. And they were doing it together with a guy who was a felon and he was in prison probably forever. And uh, in order to facilitate interaction with him um, and breed all these war dogs in their San Francisco apartment, they adopted him. And then their dogs went on to kill the neighbor down the hall. Remember that? I do not. She was that coming is, home from the grocery store. That's and, really awful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The woman uh, with the dogs, both lawyers, of course, these two, this couple, they lost, she lost control of the dogs as she was leaving her apartment and the neighbor was arriving and there was just this bloodbath. It was horrible. Jesus. Yeah, it was a bit, I'm surprised you don't remember because it was a huge um, court case that was on the news all the time for no, quite remember. a while. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe I blocked it out because it's so unpleasant. But yeah, yeah, I don't know if they got found guilty of murder or manslaughter or because they were warned a number of times that this was yeah. not an approach. I mean, Cane Corsos, those are those huge, gigantic kind of mastiffs that okay. the Romans took into war with them. You see them with the spike collars, you know, in the oh, yeah. tiles, you know, Kawe Kanem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see here. Uh, how hard was it to find? 
information about the daily life, just the way things were done. To me, that's always what really enriches an historical novel. I mean, there's things you can read about, but again, I tried to just kind of almost assume that things were the way that they are now. You know, like a princess or uh, from now would be like one then and kind of extrapolate from there. She writes about it in, in, in the Alexiad a little bit, you know, where, you know, the palaces and where they went and where they hung out and, you know, they had land here and what the people were like personality wise. And I think you could tell a lot about someone, you know, certainly from what they value and what they, you know, mm -hmm. present mm -hmm. as cool and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so even in the Alexiad, which isn't terribly great writing, um, it's uh, you can tell what she values, what qualities in men, for example, she thinks mm -hmm. are important and which ones mm -hmm. she are. You know, she's very martial in her. You know, she admires the generals in the battlefield and all this yeah. kind of stuff in, yeah. in certain ways. Yeah. Not a, not a whole lot of patience with the arty type. Yeah, she's less that. She's not she doesn't have time for it. You know, Please tell me that you didn't read this like in the original Greek or something. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, who who helped you with the Greek titles at the beginnings of sections and um Google Translate? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't laugh. One yeah. of the one of the people who watches my channel sent me a comment in Gaelic. And I was like, oh my God, this is a person who knows Gaelic. And now I'm humiliated because I don't speak Gaelic. I know three or four sentences, you know. And so I had to go to Google Translate and figure it out. And it was a very nice comment. I was so impressed because that's not easy. That's hard stuff. Just even figuring out your spelling it correctly is a challenge. So I are you to, sure I, they didn't just put it into type it into Google Translate and pop it out as a game? I'm sure. I'm sure you'd yeah. have to. I mean, I, I don't know how else you would do it. Yeah. Well, there are people, you, you know, Ryan Byrne, who has been on my podcast before, he speaks like he can read ancient Babylonian. He can read Greek. I'm sure there are people oh. that can do this. I'm just oh. not one of them. Yeah. I just see to me, that's just very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> so impressive oh my god fabulous like the yeah. cuneiform mm -hmm. oh my yeah. god but i can't i can't do it i can't do any of that no yeah. so it's uh, i hear i'm gonna cross some of this stuff out so i don't ask you again the same thing okay for heaven's sake uh unless you'd like to talk about the torture scenes again now uh, we can talk more about the the sexual politics though because i think that that is important yeah like, i'm really fascinated you know, by that the, yeah the women couldn't run the empire by themselves it just wasn't done it wasn't something that was allowed but once you were the empress once you were the empress if the emperor died you could stay in power as long as you had a son or if you married somebody else that was you know Vibe. proxy yeah so you could yeah. make an emperor by dint of you being the empress of the if you were savvy yeah. enough and they liked you you know and yeah. you could run the thing so in the book eudokia does that when her husband yeah. dies there's a lot of oh my god she's going to go away maybe her son is going to take over and she winds up you know with this guy Ra ramanus the, the guy that i said was like elon musk you know that that mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm had this terrible manzacre that was such a, a shit show that everything fell apart after that. But that was something that was allowed. But other than that, women couldn't rule by themselves. And uh, so her, you know, Anna Komnini taking over from her father was never going to be something that was going to work probably um, because she's, she was never going to be Empress because it was her dad, you know? And uh I made up the, or I extrapolated kind of the scenes where her dad is a little too, is gross with her. But in the Alexiad, it is hinted at that, that, that Alexios and his mother were weird. Like that was a thing that they were, they seemed like they were kind oh, of a couple. And, sure. and again, Alexios married somebody who was 10. So his wife was way younger than him. And it was, there's weird shit going on for sure. Like I didn't make that up. So I just sort of extrapolated what was already yeah in the record and known and they don't write about it explicitly, but you can kind of tell if there's lots of rumors about this, that, and the other rumors are probably true, you know? Oh, but yeah. Yeah. And women, women, uh, had no value other than, uh, their marital potential and the political connections I could give you. And if you weren't somebody important in an important ruling family, 
women were subhuman. They were just chattel. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. It's it's difficult for us, I think, in the United States anyway, to, to wrap our heads around that. Although we may be finding out soon enough. Yeah. You know. Uh, well, women I, could only vote for the, la the last hundred years. Like, it's 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 really kind of nuts if, if you stop and think about it. Oh, the hardest thing about writing this book was not being able to use the word mansplain, which is, you know, wouldn't affect because there's scene there's a scene where Maria is talking to like four guys and they're trying to explain shit to her and she's like, Yeah, I know that already. Way ahead of you guys. Way ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah. Oh, and I love the the comment you made along the way there that heretics were free thinkers. Yeah. Or yeah. vice versa, free thinkers mm -hmm. were actually just heretics. So you, you know, obviously, without really being obvious about it, maybe I'm extrapolating and I'm reading too much into it, but I felt like you were seeing some parallels to the nonsense going on to our time today, you know, to our political intrigues going on today. I mean, for example, the um, the First Crusade, all I could think of was, you know, Oath Keepers, uh, yeah. <laughs> Proud Boys. Yeah. That kind of rabble just being set loose on a, on you know, think of what they did in in the Capitol building, but writ large on an entire yeah. community, a town, countryside. You know, they were like locusts as they went, and they had no compassion for anybody. It was really truly terrible. Um, so I did something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to feel about this. Uh -oh. One of the things I loved about your book, because I'm kind of a vocabulary snob okay was your use of the english language i thought it was a real gesture of respect you know to the ancient greek and the ancient latin when you could use a big word you did and i loved it so Thank i you. started writing them down just words that struck my fancy <laughs> and and i only did it for a couple of chapters and then it was interrupting the flow of the story for me because there were so many of them but today i i made a little list of them and, and something funny struck me and i thought i would share it with you and i hope that you don't think this is a waste of time i took these words and i tried to come up with and these are mostly adjectives, not all, mostly adjectives describing characters in the book. And I thought, well, who, who would I use to describe that person today that, you know, Ooh, might This be is a fun game. I like this might game. I wasn't sure where you were going to go, but okay, good. Okay. Adumbration. Oh, adumbration. Yeah, adumbration is the, you know, you, a sketch and, of... And, and, and just to give you a hint to let you know how my mind was working, sometimes I took it literally and sometimes I went a little symbolic. Okay. Oh, I, you know, I, I thought you were going to say. Oh, I'm hoping that you can guess. I'll just give you a second to oh, think I, of somebody. I I'll give you a hint. Okay. We're talking mostly politicians. No, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I don't know. Tell me. That's a hard okay. one. It's a hard one to start with. So, Adam Bration is sort of in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Shady. McConnell. Yeah. Okay, good. Right. Good. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. Yep. Um. Presbicacious. Okay. That's easy. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> Usually it's a Sherlock Holmesy. It's a like perspicacity of Sherlock Holmes, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know anybody in, in DC who is that way. <laughs> oh, well, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Sheldon Whitehouse. He is. Yes, he is. Yes, yes, yeah. he is. Okay. Yes. Uh, vicissitudes. Vicissitudes is. is this is my uh, favorite person to, to apply this to god vicissitudes who would oh, i apply on. it to uh i feel like there's something really obvious here yes um okay I'll, I'll think about a speech that was made very 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 recently well you're gonna say it, trump yes okay yeah yeah, yeah his yeah. fortunes are changing i think yeah 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 okay, okay. this is one of my favorite i i love this <laughs> plangently Oh, I love the word plangently. Yes, yeah. it's great. Plangently is just a word we can use to apply to MAGA tears. We drink out of coffee it, mugs. Yeah, but I got a little more specific and I came up with General Marjorie. Okay. Marjorie Taylor Green. Yeah. Yep, that works. Okay, that's somebody who complains loudly. Um, <laughs> pusillanimous. <laughs> pusillanimous can be any one of a number of people. I described Kevin McCarthy as pusillanimous on my podcast for tomorrow. You know, yeah. I thought about 
I thought about him, but then I thought of a, a little slightly more obvious Josh Hawley running away like a baby. Yep, pusillanimous. Yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, adamantine. Adamantine. Yeah, that's that's Pelosi. That's tough. Yes, as nails, you got yeah. it. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, obsequious. <laughs> oh, so many. There's so many people qualify. Oh, oh, no, this one is glaringly on. Well, there's that guy on Twitter, Nick Adams, who's constantly, you know, kissing up oh, to Trump. I don't but know that. I yeah, you're better off in, not. Don't even DC. don't even look into it. But somebody uh, with a really brown nose. Yeah, but it could be like Pence. It could be. You well, know, oh, I hadn't thought of him, but yeah. you're right. It could Lindsay be Lindsey Graham. Graham. Lindsey Graham. Yeah. yeah. Lindsey Graham. Yeah. Uh, concupiscent. Concupiscent. I don't even remember what that means. It means somebody <laughs> who's like oversexed. Oh, right, 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 right. In in the thing. Uh, hmm. I feel like if I answer that, I'm going to get myself in trouble. I don't know. Matt you, Gates. That's what that's I had to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what uh, I was going to say. And then obdurate has to get once again be nancy pelosi you know i feel like obdurate has a has a negative connotation though so i don't know which she can be that way though yeah you know, kind of depends on what side of an argument you happen to be on and now the last one i could not think of anybody so this is your assignment first i mean i know what it means but i just don't know anybody that well enough uh ursine okay uh that f that guy the the, the um this new scandal, this FTX scandal, the guy Sam Friedman, whatever his name is, he's an Ursine guy. I mean, he he's he looks like a bear, you know. He's just who is it? I mean, he was the it? CEO for this thing FTX. It's this huge financial scandal that's happening now that just sort of How started. How do I not know anything about it? It just started. It's it's crypto. It's weird, and oh, it'll be. I, yeah. and, and you say crypto, and I shut down. I'm yeah, just, I'm oh. trying to think of a politician that I would describe that way, and yeah, not many people are coming to mind. No. Um, yeah. No, I uh, think more like Harvey Weinstein or something. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just thought that was kind of a fun little game, you know. And I think I've hit on most of the questions that I had. Oh, I know what I was going to do. Um, I was going to ask you, have you ever, have you been to Italy? Yes, I've been to Italy. Have you been to Ravenna? No, I didn't see. I know the, um, I love that, that mosaic. Um. What's Ravenna cool about it, that's Theodora, not... but yes. the entire mosaic, which, hold on, uh, hold on here, I have a book somewhere that has, it. is this the one? No. Oh yeah, here we go. This is the same mosaic, right? And oh, yes, yes. That's, I... that's Justinian, but like, you know, sometimes you look at this ancient art and you're like... I don't get a beat on that at all. It doesn't even look like a real person. Yeah, there. Those yeah. guys in that thing. Yeah. You're like, I saw her at the food store like two weeks ago. Like they really look like real, like real people. It's yeah. astonishing to me how something that old and it's a mosaic can look that like, not just lifelike, but like, oh yeah, that's isn't wasn't she like on flea bag or something? Like I, you know, they just look yeah, very, very very real. Very uh, contemporary. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And and actually, like they have a little bit of a personality. Yeah, and it's yeah. Really interesting to look at one of those pictures with um, Theodora. Those guys that are with her are her eunuchs. And mm. if you look, I mean, I I think if it's pointed out to you, then you start to see it. But if someone didn't pointed out, it would go over your head. They have that kind of chubby sort of yeah, yeah. rounded you know mm -hmm. and, and i didn't pick up on that but i i have been to ravenna one of oh, the wow. okay. sterling moments of my life we spent an entire day in ravenna at uh the santa polinaire which is the church that actually uh theodoric the the ostrogoth built Oh, wow. And then, okay. then the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox took it over. And then also at San Vitale, which is Justinian and Theodora's um, church that's built uh, as an octagon. It has a pool, a small, it's almost like you're stepping into a an illustrious decorated foot bath. It's not a big thing. Okay. It's a pool, but it's built on the side of a Roman spring where they used to have ancient 
ceremonies. Oh, that's they do cool. that a lot. There's yeah. a church in Rome that, and, and this is common, so I'm sure there's more than one. You go in and there's the church and they have mass every Sunday and the priests running around handing out prayer cards. And then you go down some stairs and all of a sudden there's the frescoes from the early Christians, you know, like maybe 400 or whatever. But you go down a few more stairs and there's the stone altar to Mithras. Wow. Okay. And they build, you know, they build one on top of the other because it helps to keep people coming and it draws people in and mm -hmm. then you can brainwash them and you got them. You got your hooks. Right. You right. But uh, Ravenna has the best Byzantine art outside of Istanbul. So I would recommend anybody who's interested in the Byzantine empire wants to see what the artwork like is like the mosaics they're breathtaking i mean they're just yeah. stunning beautiful beautiful stuff the cool like on the coinage in roman coins when they show the portrait it's always the head is off to the side yes profile byzantine yeah. they're looking at you and they're like this and it looks like a comic book i think it's very cool it's weird stylistically it's completely different and uh i kind of like the style it's just um you know uh very distinctive and comic booky i would say what's the most unique coin that you've ever had a dealing with i mean we don't deal in anything like super you know expensive rare <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so uh but you know some of the stuff is really cool like the roman stuff is cool and the byzantine yeah. coins are they're just neat looking you know i've seen gold coins with these people on them and um i was gonna buy a, a gold coin that had maria of alanya on the reverse with michael but it was like $350 and this was like in 2015. So I was like, ah, it's a little too much. And I regret not buying it. I wish I had bought it. Oh, well, it's always the way. And then you yeah. probably bought some souvenirs that are in a drawer somewhere that you never yeah, you look at, it, you know? I, <laughs> I, I would have liked it. I know how that goes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's overwhelming know. in Italy. Now, I haven't traveled a lot, but uh, Italy, you can be walking down this big urban city street with, you know, the equivalent of 31 flavors and Starbucks, but Italian, you know, and you look over at an empty lot and it's just antiquities lying on the ground, right on the yeah. surface, you know, broken pots and inscriptions and columns. And, and we, we talked to a, um, an archeologist, we were, I think it was Herculaneum. And there was this woman inside one of the falling down, you know, ruins, and she was on her hands and knees washing this tessellated tile floor. And she was really irritated because people kept coming in, tourists, and walking across her clean floor. And I thought, this is nuts. What is she doing? And so we asked her. And, you know, she spoke Italian and we tried, but that was a joke. But we finally got her story. She was an archaeologist. She was making a book of the floors of Rome. That's all. Oh, wow. or the okay. floors of Italy, the old Roman floors. Mm -hmm. And because often they were stone and tile mosaic and they're the last things to go. The building fell, but the floors are still there. Ostia is like that. Yeah. And uh, she said it's never been done because there's so much antiquity to be cataloged and studied in Italy that the government has doesn't have the money. There's just they're, it's not that they don't invest in it. It's that they're so completely overwhelmed with the riches, the largesse, of, yeah. uh, which is stunning. And someday I'd love to go to Constantinople, but not this week. No, no, not this week. It's not, not the right weather. You know, you want to. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you yeah. watch, you watch this great show. I'm a big believer in trash reality shows because they keep me grounded. They make me feel mentally OK. Okay. Like I'm normal. So there's one called 90 Day Fiance. Ah, I was going to say, it's going to be 90 Day Fiance. My, my, my wife and my, my one son watched that. Yeah. Great okay. show. Fabulous show. A <laughs> little bit of travel, a little bit of culture, a little bit of foreign languages, and lots of melodrama. It's wonderful. Uh, several of the young women on that show in the past couple of years have been from Kiev. Okay. And so I've had the great pleasure, and I'm not being snarky, of seeing, you know, the side streets of Kiev while people are wandering around looking for places, and you really got to see it. And it was it's a was a beautiful place. Um, so that's particularly poignant to know about. But one couple, a couple of years ago, uh met up. She was Russian and he was American, and they met up in Turkey. 
it was because of visas visiting yeah 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 and it looked beautiful i mean really beautiful not i don't believe they were in istanbul they were in more of a touristy place on the ocean well istanbul's on the ocean but just really really a beautiful place to visit and i would recommend you know yeah I'd, I'd love to go because i mean it's a beautiful it, istanbul's beautiful like it's one of the beautiful places yeah. it just is so yeah you know, skyline and everything and i think you know that's another just to close the the thing about the book like one of the things about the Byzantine Empire, why people don't know about it, is because in, um, what was it, 1453, uh, the Ottoman Turks invaded, finally broke through and conquered it and have held it since then, made it theirs, which is, you know, that happens. And uh, a lot of that culture wasn't wiped out, but it was definitely subsumed. So Hagia Sophia is a mosque now. And, um, you know, it's when you, we talk about Rome, we can go to Italy and go to Rome and Rome is still right. there. And as you say, yeah. there's what's wonderful about Rome today is there's all oh, this wonderful, crazy antiquities everywhere. Oh. And the people that live there don't give a shit. It's awesome. It's like New York. It's so <laughs> great. But we like, were walking down the street and we saw what looked like tucked into a, a construction was a bit of an old building, a public spot. We said, let's, let's check what out what that is well it was you know just an old church full of walls <laughs> painted by michelangelo just wow. you know <laughs> just there yeah just <laughs> yeah. hanging out yeah but there isn't you can't do that with you know it's a different language different a, entirely different culture has lived there for you know the last 600 years so it's not it's gone it's effectively vanished this empire that at one time was the largest empire in the world for a thousand years the currency of byzantium you know of, of the byzantine empire was what was used everywhere i think shakespeare calls it a byzant you know um and was the bulwark you know sort of uh from stopping um you know muslim incursion deeper into europe uh and was the center of, of learning and intellectual culture and christendom for centuries and now it's just gone you know so it's interesting because even in researching this book like these people are real but if you go to the wikipedia pages not all that much information you know no, there really, isn't because i did uh, yeah. And, yeah and and some of it was wrong like there was things about you eudokia being born at a certain time i'm like that's not right she wasn't having children when she was 53 you know that's that isn't yeah. what happened so that must be wrong yeah. and uh you know it, it's we don't know that much about it, even though it was so, so important. And I guess, you know, they call it the Dark Ages. That's something that was invented by a German historian in 1920 or something. It's not really accurate to say that the Middle Ages are the Dark Ages because lots of cool shit was happening. But, uh, you know, this was a place where there was culture and learning. And it was the that's where, you know, forks were invented and people started men started wearing pants, you know modern medicine <laughs> yeah all of it so yeah, it's important it. culture and uh so it's a lot of fun to research and write about and uh plus it just it's a cool word you know byzantine byzantium just a cool word it's a lot of fun to read i really Thank recommend you. this book it's 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 a great uh escape yeah it has nothing to do with place. anything it's wonderful <laughs> well but and yet it does yeah strangely enough it does. yet it it's does because people like you said don't change that much they do not yeah nope. so yep. i really appreciate you being willing to talk about it and no thank you so much this was so much fun for me because i haven't really talked about it with anybody so it was a lot of fun um you haven't been on any book tours or no it's i've got too much like just you know this book sat on my hard drive for years and i'm I finally i said i just want it to be out in the world and oh, you know yeah. maybe people will read it maybe they won't but I'm i'm busy doing so many other things i wanted it to at least be there and you know, people, not everybody likes this kind of thing, which is fine. But, you know, if you if you like this kind of thing, it's 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 not bad, you know. Oh, so. I'm a big fan of historical <laughs> fiction. So, yeah, yeah, big fan of anything that comes between two pages, uh, two covers, you know. <laughs> Bless your heart. It's, it's fabulous. I really, really enjoyed it. And, and I appreciate you being willing to talk about it, too. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. No, nice to see you, too. I'm glad you're hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> my next topic, I was telling uh, Greg a minute ago, well, or the beginning of this, that uh, I've been researching the death of newspapers. So I, I think it's a way to end this. The reason we know so little about this time period, you, you said it yourself. The language is inaccessible. And, and maybe a time will come in a better world when people will go back and translate this stuff and make it accessible to the rest of us so that, you know, that we learn about these time periods because these people were fascinating. Yeah, it's, they were. All, yeah, all historical time periods. People don't, I used to think Roman, you know, Roman history was dull until I learned about it. <laughs> Roman history is not dull at all. There's well, so much, you know, so much crazy stuff. No, but yeah, yeah you're just like, oh, it's a guy in a toga. Uh, exactly. All the same name. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. grapes, olives, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything at all about the peacocks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I really, really appreciate it. And would you promise me the next time you publish a book, you'll come back and talk about it? Whenever that myst mystery date is far in the future, I absolutely will. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Okay, goodbye, everybody. And we'll all be back with happy news about newspapers next. So, <laughs> slung the foil.